Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sunday Evening Chapel on Sunday, April 19th. I'm glad to be with you and hope you've had a great weekend and that this service helps your new week get off to a great start. As we keep moving forward with virtual chapel services this spring, I'm going to share uh, pieces of Brooks School history and Ashburn Chapel history in particular with you as part of these welcomes. And tonight, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about Edward W. Flint, uh, who joined the faculty in 1936 and remained until 1968. He was the school's first organist. And there is a plaque, uh, like the other plaques and the many beautiful etchings in the woodwork in our chapel, uh, right to our left as we come in uh, on the bench that we all uh, know quite well. And so I'm going to show it to you and read you what it says. So as you can see, uh, Edward, in loving memory of Edward W. Flint, choir master, organist, teacher of mathematics, 1936 to 1968, perfection was his goal. And the thing I really want you to know about Mr. Flint is the fact that he designed the organ that we have and enjoy so much week after week. Uh, the Aeolian Skinner Company was the manufacturer of the organ itself, and it came to the school in 1938 as a gift from the Danforth family. And uh, Mr. Flint was the first person to play it, and he designed it in a way that would allow it to be expanded over time as the chapel itself expanded. And I know that Mr. Humphreyville would concur with me in saying that he was one of the finest organists of his time, really a legendary figure that the school uh, drew so much from over the course of his 32 years here, much like Mr. Humphreyville is one of the finest organists of his time. So there is our organ behind us over there. And at one point, very late in his career, or shortly after he retired in the late 60s, early 70s, Mr. Flint said this about our organ's tone, and I wanted to share it with you verbatim, and I quote, to the layman, this type of tone can be described by saying that it is brilliant, clear, and penetrating, yet not shrill, incisive, though not coarse, transparent rather than dense, and light rather than ponderous. The ensemble builds up, not out. In these respects, the new Brooks organ may at first hearing sound strange to ears accustomed only to 20th century American organs, which have generally been thick, unduly, powerful, oppressive. In designing the organ, the intent has been to build a sound musical instrument, not to copy an antiquarian model. So I don't know about all of you, but I wouldn't trade the organ that we have and have had since 1938, one of the jewels of this campus, for any organ anywhere else in the world, just like I wouldn't trade our organist, Mr. Humphreyville, for any other organist anywhere in the world. So enjoy tonight's chapel service, and in particular, uh, the organ playing talent of Mr. Humphreyville, and keep in mind that this organ we have here is what it is today, because Mr. Flint and those who followed him have taken such incredibly good care of it. Have a great night and start to your week and take good care. Our opening hymn is The Day Thou Gavest. Mr. Humphreyville will play it on the chapel organ. You and your family are invited to sing along. The words will appear on the screen.
first reading is from the Gospel of Luke. A dispute arose among the disciples as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. The second reading is from the Dalai Lama. If you shift your focus from yourselves to others, extend your concern to others, and cultivate the thought of caring for the well-being of others, then this will have the immediate effect of opening up your life and helping you to reach out. The third reading is from Mother Teresa of Calcutta. A life not lived for others is not a life. Everybody, I hope you're all feeling safe and healthy and finding some bright spots in these strange days that we're living through right now. I want to tell you a little story. It's about something that happened to me when I was a kid. I think I was probably in third grade. In my backyard, I found a cocoon on the stem of a plant, probably a weed, and I picked it and I took it in the house and put it in a jar and set it on the table next to my bed. And the cocoon sat there for a couple of weeks doing nothing. And then one afternoon I was sitting there and I heard some scratching noises from the cocoon. And then as I watched, uh, a strange insect chewed its way out of the cocoon and climbed up the stem and perched on the rim of the jar that was holding it. And it was, uh, it was an ugly thing. It kind of looked, it looked squashed. It looked as though somebody, it was all rumpled. It looked as though somebody had stepped on it. <clears throat> but then amazingly, uh, the rumpled part of it began to just unfold and spread out and became wings. And in a minute, that rumpled, crushed looking insect transferred, transformed into a beautiful butterfly. It was an amazing thing to watch, and I've never forgotten it. And I've been thinking about that cocoon uh, because it's now six weeks since uh, my wife Anne and I uh, isolated ourselves in our house. We went into our own coronavirus cocoon, and I think it's probably been three or four weeks at least, if not more, for most of you that you've been cocooned in the middle of this health crisis. And I think about that uh, that cocoon that I had by my bedside, it, it looked, you couldn't see the changes from the outside, uh, but inside that cocoon, there were some amazing changes happening. And I, I'm thinking about what's happening to all of us while we're in our cocoon uh, in this odd time. And I know that I've gone through some changes that I wouldn't have expected, and I expect that it's probably true for most of us. At the beginning, I just resisted the whole idea. I was not going to sh shut myself up in my house and stay away from other people. Uh, but then I got over that, and I had to accept that I needed to do this. And so the next step was just figuring out how to uh, get a, how to shop, how to get a hold of food and everything else that we needed for our daily life. And then the next up, and it was a biggie for me, was to learn how to communicate with the rest of the world digitally on screen instead of in person. Uh, I don't think of myself as a, a very technologically uh, sophisticated. And so learning how to communicate with the world via Zoom and Google Google meat was not the easiest thing for me to do, uh, but I uh, managed it and I'm feeling like I've sort of got the hang of it now. Uh, and now I, we seem to be into the stage of thinking, okay, we've learned how to do this. We figured out how to live in this cocoon. Now, how long is it going to last? That's the stage we're at now. How long is this going to last? How long do we have to do this? And the big question what's the world going to be like that we return to when we all emerge from our cocoons? And I can see that I'm not the only one who's asking that question because the news is full of people with all kinds of opinions, uh, some 
I think, rather sensible and others not about, uh, about the whole process of emerging from our cocoons. Uh, I've seen some people's opinions that we need to stay cocooned for a whole year. I've seen other people saying, well, we can't come out today, but maybe in a couple of weeks. And then there's a group of people, and they seem to be kind of angry right now, who are saying, enough of this. We, we need to get back to where we, are, we, we were right now. Uh, the truth is, I don't think that, I doubt that we're going to go back to where we were. I think the, this experience is going to uh, have some changes for all of us, changes in the way we think about the world that we live in, changes in the way we live. I think there are likely to be some economic and social changes uh, that may last uh, for some time. And um, I think that uh, we don't have a clear sense yet of exactly what the world is going to be like that we re-emerge into. And uh, I think that it's probably uh, not a good idea for us to try to decide right away ahead of time uh, what that world is going to be like. I think we need to give it time. We need to give ourselves time to see what happens, to understand where we're going um, and uh, how we manage uh, in the, in, as we get through this, uh, this challenging time. Uh, I know it's a frustrating time. It is for me. I'm sure it is for many of you. There are times when I feel uh, really frustrated because I can't do some of the things that I want to do. There are times that I feel just bored. I don't know what to do. And there are times when I feel trapped and I don't like that feeling. Um, so how do we deal with these feelings of feeling trapped and frustrated? Um, I don't really know the answer, or I know one answer, and I think the answer is, the answer is love. The answer is to try to focus on loving one another and taking care of one another and doing everything that we can to help others get through this with us uh, and especially to help those who are most vulnerable and uh, most in danger of being harmed uh, by this virus that's going around and by the, the problems that are going with it. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think that the, what we most need to do is focus on loving one another and caring one another and we need to be patient as we as we see how this plays out and what what the world is like that we come back to when we come back. Uh, that I know that may sound a little Pollyanna-ish, and I think when I was 16 years old, I might have been a little impatient uh, with somebody who, had, if somebody had said that to me. Uh, but the older I get, the more the more I realize that. So often in life, the solution, the answer to the problems we face is simply to love, to love one another, to love ourselves, and to care about those around us. Um, that's really the message in the three readings that we, that we have today. Uh, the message, I think, is, is the same in all of them. It's that love and caring for others are one and the same thing, that you can't have one without the other. Uh, there are people who uh, stumble onto the light and love of God, and then they, as a result, they devote the rest of their lives to, uh, to seeking to uh, serve and care for other people. And there are people who set out to devote their lives to caring for other people, and somehow in the process of, of doing that, they find the light and the love of God, or perhaps it's more accurate to say the light and love of God finds them. Uh, I, don't, I don't pretend to know how or when the light or love of God finds any of us, um, but I do know one thing, and it's probably the, <laughs> it's probably the only thing I do know, which is that uh, when the light and love of God finds us, it can transform us, it can change us, it can make us new, it can make us whole, it can redeem us, it can fill us with love and joy and wonder and power and strength and grace uh, to a degree that we cannot even imagine 
until it happens. And, uh, and I know also that often the love and light of God finds us when we're in the dark places of our lives, when, when we're feeling that we don't know what to do, when we're feeling that we're up against the wall, uh, when we're feeling trapped. And I know, too, that when the light and uh, love of God comes to us, that the way that plays out, plays out is that we, we turn to spending our lives in the service and uh, in loving others and in serving them. Uh, so uh, I hope, I, I encourage myself and all of us uh, to think about uh, in, these, in, the, in this artificially restricted life that we're living right now, I encourage all of us to, um, uh, to look, for, uh, look for opportunities to express the love that we feel for those people who are around us and look for ways to serve them and look for ways to serve everyone who's in need. They don't need to be big ways. I think most of the time they're little ways. Maybe just a kind word in one, at one moment, at another time, just being patient with somebody who gets under our skin about something. And finally, um, just a smile. Um, you know, God's love is like an, a, a, an enormous, cosmic, wonderful smile smiling on the whole world. And when we smile at one another, we, we send a tiny bit of that smiling love of God along its way to someone else. And we never know where that smile stops. We never know where it reaches to. We never know who it touches. So I encourage you, stay, stay healthy, stay safe. Uh, do the best you can to find good things in this time. And above all, keep smiling. Um, God bless you. Amen. Our closing hymn is Seeky First. Mr. Humphrey will play on the chapel organ and you and your family are invited to sing along. The words will appear on the screen. to join me in prayer. Great spirit of love, be present with us and hold us together in our hearts, even though we are distant from one another. Keep us mindful that in spite of all troubles and challenges, you are always with us, always showing us the way to fullness of life. Open our hearts to the needs of those around us and give us the will to serve others as you have served us. Open our minds to all the wonders of this life and hold us always in the circle of your loving care. Amen.